I'm Mike Cornett with WUSF 89.7's All Night Jazz, and joining me via Zoom right now, Chick Correa. Chick, how are you? Nice talking to you, man. I'm doing fine. Now, Chick's got a show coming up, an actual show. This is amazing. My, so he's going to be performing first, uh, Friday first. and Saturday, the 23rd and 24th of October. And this is going to be at Ruth Eckert Hall in the Kate Tiedemann and Ellen Cotton Cabaret Theater. More information, RuthEckertHall.com. And this is a, a, really, a really different event. I'm going to ask you how many other kinds of events are you doing live these days, but this one, just so everybody knows, face masks required. It's going to be uh, tables of four. Chick has actually even curated the menu. Yes. Uh, a bit of it. A bit of it. I, I, bit mean, of it. I, I don't think everyone's going to like uh, my, my, uh, my vegan offerings, but some, some might enjoy it. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, this is going to be my first uh, live gig since... Since the lockdown uh, found me in Europe in the middle of March. Wow! Then, how was that when that first happened? When you were in in Europe, how, well, how long was, were you? It was pretty weird. We were seeing things uh, like kind of close quickly around us. Things were closing down, and so before before the whole tsunami of close down happened, uh, I I. Uh, I, me and my team, we booked, um, we booked our flights back home because we were in, um, uh, we were in uh, uh, Bucharest, I think. Uh, <laughs> we were in somewhere in Eastern Europe and um, our gig uh, that was coming up in two days got canceled and we go, oh gee, what are we gonna do? So we jumped on a plane and we just made it back into the States. And we've been, so I haven't done a live gig since the middle of March. So this is going to be kind of exciting in a way then, right? Very exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. Now, uh, you've been nominated 65 times for a Grammy and just won one this year for your Antidote release. And then you've just put out a new recording, which is the first recording you've put out since your Grammy winner. And, and it's kind of what you're doing on this show, right? It's a double disc, Chick Corea plays on Concord Records. And part of that show is actually recorded right here in Clearwater. I was at that show and that was a great show. So uh, how, how different is this show going to be from that show? Well, I mean, every every show I do is really different from the show before because most of most of the most of what I play is improvised. Uh, so, uh, but but as far as the uh, as far as the the material I'm I'm using, uh, I'm going to do a couple of pieces from the record. Um, I'm going to I I've been starting my my shows. Uh, I I've been loving to start with this particular Mozart uh, adagio uh, uh, second movement of this piano sonata that Mozart wrote. It's a beautiful calming piece and it, and it sets a mood for me and a nice calm mood for the, uh, for the rest of the show. But then, then I'm gonna be combining composers again. It's, I've been loving to do that. Stevie Wonder and Jerome Kern and uh, Bill Evans and uh, Thelonious Monk and uh, Duke Ellington and, then I'm going to play some of my own uh, compositions as well. Well, that's I saw that show it was really exciting, and the and the recording is is really nice as well. And part of it's uh, you're trying to get the audience involved right in in the beginning. How, I mean, because it's going to be a little bit challenging, you know, when you're just up there by yourself to try to feel like the audience is there with you. What do you do to get everybody kind of in that mental state that you have to be in? It's real simple. I mean, especially live is real simple. I, I just did a solo live stream show. That's a little bit trickier because because I don't see the physical bodies in front of me. I did a show to to uh, uh, to uh, a big audience from uh, six continents. People tuned in from all around the world, and so I was just in front of a camera playing, uh, and that was difficult but when i have a live audience in front of me it's uh it's quite easy because they're right there and i i talk to them i tell them what i'm doing and and i i get feedback right away plus the fact that uh, similarly uh to the game that i played on the plays record i'm going to invite some people to come up to uh to do portraits musical portraits they'll be socially distanced of course so you won't be doing the duet thing though right no, I think duet at this point is a little bit too close. Yeah. Uh, for, for too too close for comfort. Um, uh, but uh, but cer certainly I can invite a couple of people up to sit to sit at me from a, in a short distance from the piano, and I can do uh, some musical portraits, which I love to do. I just I just uh, say hello, you know, uh, uh, find out the person's name, and we. It's not really an interview. Uh, and and uh, get to see 
this human being in front of me and and uh, I love the challenge of looking at something, especially someone, a, a, a person, and uh, uh, improvising a piece of music that is like a portrait. Uh, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to do. I used to do it when I was a kid with my uh, cousins. It's fun to watch, too, you know, because what you do is, I mean, you just literally sit somewhere down on the stage and then you just create. And, and sometimes the, the, the results are really intriguing. It was, it was fun. Now, when you're on a concert you're in these solo shows, you're really kind of moving back and forth between the classics. You're doing Scarlatti, you're doing Mozart and Monk, and like you said, Stevie Wonder. I mean, how do you view the differences between all of those composers and try to keep that all congruous to the, to the listener? Well, the trick, which is no trick, the secret is that there's no secret also, which is the fact that, uh, you know, this is the way I conceive of music. Uh, when when uh, I when I play a composition by Stevie Wonder, and then I play a composition by Mozart, it, it, it's I'm playing them now. I'm not playing Mozart's music uh, 200 years ago. I'm taking that score that Mozart wrote directly, the notes that he wrote, and I'm giving them my interpretation right now, just like Stevie. Stevie, uh, the the tunes I'm um, choosing of Stevie's are, are ones that he made in the 70s and, and the 80s. Uh, but there's no time disappears when, when, uh, when I'm playing music and uh, different composers and different influences and all are coming together in a moment now. So in my mind, it, it's all merging. But when, when I say, well, I'm going to play some Mozart and then I'm going to play some Stevie Wonder, it seems like, how can you do that? But uh, uh, it's it's my view of the music, and it's my it, it's the way I see how these uh, uh, composers, and actually most of them, uh, interestingly enough, are pianists. But uh, you know uh, Mozart and Duke Ellington and Polonius Monk and Stevie Wonder, they're keyboard players, they're pianists. So they follow along. I uh, my life has followed along in a tradition like that. I write music and I play the, the keyboards. Uh, so they're sort of like my friends, these guys, and, and uh, I picture them as my friends. So when I put them together, um, I can see a, a, a lot of similarities in how, how, it all, uh, how it's all just music. No, I can see that. And, when, and, and for our listeners, when you go and watch this show, uh, it, it, it just flows. It just seem, it's seamless. It's really interesting to watch. And, it's interesting you, know, you, you call the, the musicians your friends, but I just, sometimes you feel like the songs themselves are your friends as, as well. I well, feel that when I program too. Yeah, yeah, in a, in a sense, but, but the, the, song, the song always is the person who wrote it. Like, like those notes, that, there's that Mozart song, but that's Mozart. But then he wrote this song and this song and this song and this song and all, you know, so, uh, um, uh, you know, it's an interesting point that when you start when you're studying music, and you start and you play the music of a composer, uh, and you get, you get the the notation that he wrote down. It's just like it's just like uh, uh, someone you know you get Shakespeare's sonnet, and you read his words. Well, he wrote those words. See, so you're not getting an interpretation of the words if you're reading them off the page. That's what it's Shakespeare to you. So that so when I read those Mozart notes off the page, I'm not thinking of someone's rendition of it. I'm thinking of there's the notes, and and here's I'm reading the notes myself, and here's my interpretation of them. So it's a very I get this very direct contact with the uh, with the composer himself. So will you be doing any of your children's songs? I noticed those were on the repertoire for the concert back in 2018 here in Clearwater, and also on the album. Will you be performing those as well? Yes, uh, I think I'm, I'm probably going to, uh, you know, for, for years I've been uh, centering my children's songs performances on the, the earliest children's songs. There's 20 of them, and I've been doing more or less the first 10 or so because they're, they're simpler. As, as, as the number, the children's song numbers go up, they get a little bit more involved. And so this time I think I'm going to play, I'm going to choose from the last 10 
So I'm okay. going to do some different children's songs, a little bit more, more mature children. <laughs> I was going to ask you what your process was for picking which ones you did. So you explained it really nicely. I was going to say, was it like picking real children? I don't know. What's your favorite uh, child? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, 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 there's a lot of variability in that. You really can't nail down skill with age. Uh, be, because I've seen some really, really young people who have incredible skill uh, and, uh, uh, and seen some older people who have less skill than the younger people. So age really doesn't have a whole lot to do with it. But uh, it's kind of, a, kind of a state of mind, you know, how simple is it or how complex is it? Like you see some young kids that, that are into, uh, uh, I, I, I was talking, I was talking to, on my workshop yesterday, I, I had as my guest Herbie Hancock, my, my great friend. And Herbie was talking about how when he was a, I asked him, what did he do to learn when he was, um, uh, when did he first get interested in music? And he relayed these in, this, this thing of when he was a kid, like really four, three, four, five years old, he used to like to take things apart. So he would, he, he, he would get a screwdriver and a wrench and he would take clocks apart and, and other, other things to, to discover what was in them. And he, he majored in science in, uh, in, in uh, college, you know. So, so different, at a young age, he was already like a little scientist, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> So it, it's, it's beyond age. So my, my later children's songs tend to get a little bit more intricate. I was going to ask you, you mentioned that uh, you talked about virtual concerts and your workshop. I mean, you have just been all over social media. Uh, mad skills you've got there because you've been doing workshops and dropping music videos and all kinds of stuff. What's your philosophy about social media? Uh, well, the internet in general and, and social media is like a, an impersonal network. It's just impersonal. It's all out there and everyone can be in there and you don't know who they, they are. Hope, hopefully they're all part of the human race and, <laughs> and, uh, and we're a family. <laughs> so, so that's kind of the, the general idea. But, but uh, uh, I, I like to try to, uh, uh, to put positive, positive messages out and then co collect, uh, you know, when you have, uh, I guess it's like, uh, I don't know, it's like marketing. You find people of like mind and uh, the music will, uh, the, the music that I put out will collect people who like that kind of thing. And so they, a little group collects. The nice thing about it that, that I like is that, uh, uh, that is coming to fruition after a lifetime of touring is that I've been touring the world uh, around, you know, Europe, South America, Asia, all over the United States, Australia, um, since, mm, well, since I went out on the road with Stan Getz in 1967. So, so since then, and with my own bands, I've collected a lot of friends and fans around the world. So True. with, 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 uh, with the internet, like I did the other night, it was amazing. It was possible to connect with people from everywhere at, at a present time moment. And uh, uh, that, that to me is very exciting. And I think the internet and social media can be a tool. And like any tool, it can be used for great things or it can be used for not such great things. So, so it depends on who uses the tool. So you've got all these great working active bands you know you've got your acoustic trio with Dave Weckl and John Petitucci your trilogy trio with Christian McBride and Brian Blade your Spanish heart band your electric band uh what's what's chick working on now you've always got something in the pipeline what's happening well uh, uh, uh several exciting things actually uh next next year of course is going to be uh the opening up of the world again uh, we're all we're all looking forward to that. So yes. so I'm booking a lot of uh, a lot of concerts for for next year uh, everywhere. I'm I'm going to be very active with uh, uh, ma mainly with actually with solo work with some orchestral work and and uh, some uh, my trio uh, is going to be the Vigilette Trio with Cal Calitos Del Puerto on the bass and Marcus Gilmore on the drums. And then in the summer. Uh, I have a, a very nice tour of the United States with the electric band because the electric band is now the original members 
I'm putting together a, a beautiful uh, three CD uh, LP pack of, of these beautiful performances we did in uh, 2017. And, uh, and, with some, and then with one brand new piece that we're gonna do uh, long distance, like everyone's gonna put their part in, we're gonna have one brand new piece. We're gonna video our performance too, like, like we're trying to use that. So the electric band and then Europe in, in the fall with the electric band again. And uh, I'm gonna have the premiere of uh, my trombone concerto. I wrote I was a gonna trombone. ask you about that. <laughs> yeah, I wrote a trombone concerto for Joe, Joe Alessi, the great principal trombonist of the New York Philharmonic and the New York Philharmonic. Unfortunately, the New York Philharmonic is kind of taking a year off to renovate Geffen Hall. So, um, so the premiere now is going to, uh, the world premiere is going to occur in San Paolo, I think, with the uh, San Paolo Orchestra with Joe Alessi playing. And then I think in 2022, uh, the New York premiere will happen. And now I'm beginning to work on a, a percussion concerto for the Philadelphia Orchestra, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, I've, something I've had in mind to do for many, many years. I love drums and percussion. And I'm You're working- You're so diverse, with, man. It's just amazing. You know, it's yeah. Just a, I love yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, you know, I'm having fun. And, but, but one of the more exciting things is the, from coming from this solo uh, piano streaming concert we did the other night, uh, I want to do more of that, invite my friends down to my studio and, and put out live shows from the studio to the world. Nice. We're talking with Chick Corea, who's going to be performing at Ruth Eckert Hall on Friday and Saturday, the 23rd and 24th of October. Tickets are available at RuthEckerHall.com. Showtimes are both nights, uh, 8 p.m. And I wanted to talk to you, you know, two things before we run. The, the uh, Grammy win, that was amazing. Fantastic record, Antidote, lovely record. And also the last time that we chatted was at the premiere of the video that you guys put together, the documentary about the making of that recording, which you can still stream online. Uh, how, did that, how did you feel about winning the Grammy? I mean, that had to be like very empowering. I mean, of all the recordings and right when all this stuff is starting to happen and, and then you win the Grammy, that's great. Congrats. Well, you know, one, one of the things about, about that was just kind of curious, which is months and months, actually a, a year before, before uh, the virus came around, uh, I, I, I was preparing the recording and the recording, the main, uh, uh, the main song of the recording was, was entitled Antidote. And that became the, the name of the recording, Antidote. The idea being that, that musicians and, and artists and what we do and helping people sing and dance and play is, is brings, a, a, a brings the spirit of creation to the world. It's kind of an antidote to all of the negative stuff that goes on. So then, then the lockdown happens <laughs> and we got a real lockdown. And, and so the, this, the, the, the lyrics from that piece become very pertinent also. So that was an extra, an extra bonus kind of weird thing uh, about the, the, that record getting, a, it got a lot of attention. And uh, the band, we, the, the, the Spanish Hot Band had, had a blast playing our European tour. We're going to do a U.S. tour at some point, too, uh, probably in 2022. Well, I look forward to seeing that. The, uh, the documentary was called In the Mind of a Master, Chick Corea, the master right here. Really appreciate you taking the time. Again, that show is going to be October 23rd and 24th. Ruth Eckert Hall. More information, RuthEckertHall.com. Chick, I want to thank you so much for taking the time. Say hi to Gail for me, will you? Yeah, I will, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for taking the time yourself, man. And, My pleasure. Uh, hope to see you soon sometime. Okay, man. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.